the Advanced Tech Podcast, providing a spotlight for innovators and disruptors. For links and show notes, and to find out how to sponsor the Advanced Tech Podcast, go to advancedtechmedia.org. You can also find and sponsor us on Patreon. If you're listening to us on iTunes, Google Play, or Android, please take a moment to subscribe and give us a rating. You can also sponsor us using Bitcoin at advancedtechmedia.org slash sponsor. Welcome to the Advanced Tech Podcast. Joining me today live from the first running of Magical Crypto Conference here in New York is Adam Back. Welcome, Adam. Thanks for having me on the show. Absolutely. So you have quite a varied background. You are a cypherpunk, a cryptographer, privacy and e-cash proponent, inventor of Hashcash, which is used in Bitcoin mining, and you have a PhD in computer science and your co-founder and CEO of Blockstream. What sparked your interest in computer science and cryptography and how did you get started? I was interested in computers. I got a ZX81, which is a Z80 based microprocessor with one kilobyte of RAM, expandable to 16 kilobytes, and a tape drive and things like that when I was a teenager and taught myself basic and then assembly programming on it. Um, so I was kind of interested in the technical challenge and the capabilities of the machine. Already then they seemed remarkably fast. Of course, they're a thousand times faster today, but you know, had a megahertz plus processor and stuff. So technically it could do like a million instructions a second, which is a lot if you could figure out ways to make these tiny little snippets of instructions, moving registers around, do something useful. So, so I did computer science at university and started doing a PhD in distributed systems. So how to use parallel computers and algorithms for keeping all the cores busy, taking into account latency and a lack of coordinated time. So there are all kinds of coordination and consensus problems and ways to break up work efficiently to keep all the CPUs busy. There are even the possibility for super linear parallelism, meaning you can get more speed from 10 processors than 10 times more. And uh, you get effects like that if you had more memory in your memory band because there was, let's say, you know, one megabyte on each core and you were running out of memory with a single core. So it's possible to get even super linear. Typically, the best you could do is linear improvements. And often you'd be sure of that because of the uh, communication delays and dead time where processes were waiting or other problems like you you didn't have enough parallelism so that's, that's the thing I was working on so you would just speculatively execute things on other processes gambling that they were the branch that was going to get taken and then of course you'd have to throw some of them away so it's kind of macro branch prediction so that's optimistic execution and then you've got the normal lack of coordinated time issues and you have to roll things back when they go wrong so that's kind of different overhead. Anyway, so uh, one of my cohorts, a student at the same period, also in the same distributed systems group, working on parallelizing RSA encryption. You know, I sat beside him and tried to understand what he was doing or what RSA encryption was. So when uh, PGP came out a while later, I was using RSA, so I knew, oh, that's uh, interesting. And it had a lot of geopolitical impact, potentially. This internet was much younger then, and people were already excited about change in the balance of power for people to do blogging and early internet applications. And so the ability for the individual to encrypt messages such that basically a government was powerless to decrypt it was pretty interesting. I mean, the establishment at the time was still getting to grips with the concept that they didn't have censorship rights on media. And I guess even in nominal democracies and uh, progressive societies, de facto, they did and still do have undue influence over media. And so the existence of independent media outlets, such as your own, made it much more difficult for the state to control narrative or set narratives, which you see playing out in any mainstream news typically today. So I found that whole geopolitical intersection with encryption very interesting. And the cypherpunks list was starting up around this time, so I just, you know, wanted to read more and... So I started to spend a lot of my time learning about cryptography and you know, reading crypto papers and trying to implement different crypto systems. So you're one of the 10 people whose research is directly cited in the Bitcoin white paper. How would you describe Bitcoin? So, I mean, I would say it has many, many properties. So it's interesting to different people for different reasons. But to me, what's interesting about it is that you can transact and store value without permission globally 
in a censorship resistant and unseizable, unfreezable way. So the sort of electronic cash properties and there's some privacy and fungibility guarantees too. Not as much, not strong privacy as you would like, but it's improving slowly as people advance technology. So it also has a kind of um, investment side where people are looking at this application area and unlike with let's say other areas of the internet where if you thought the web was interesting you could invest in Mozilla or uh, Netscape and different companies that were active in web technology and with Bitcoin it's um, you can buy the asset itself right and there is no centralized company there are lots of different competing companies working on improving things and building applications so that's a different direction and so there's one direction which starts to look at Bitcoin as a deflationary gold competitor and another track which is the electronic cash track so if if I had to choose one and only one I would actually choose the electronic cash because I think that has much more geopolitical interest but I think fortunately we can have all of these things and you know another kind of trade-off so I mentioned two trade-offs there one is gold versus uh, censorship resistant payments and then there's a trade-off within the payments so it's not guaranteed that these censorship resistant payments are going to be cheap because the technology to make this work is kind of inherently quite heavy it's got you know a billion dollars or so of mining equipment it's using gigawatts and gigawatts of power it's broadcasting gigabytes per node per month and there are 100,000 nodes so it's consuming untold amounts of bandwidth and in aggregate, there are so many copies of this blockchain that it's storing you know, petabytes of data as well. In, in replicated, the individual data is uh, under 250 gigabytes in the Bitcoin case. So you know, there is the intention between people who want to use it casually or for lower value things, which, you know, so if somebody's using it for a geopolitically interesting use case, they will pay for it because there's no other alternative. Uh, even if it becomes, you know, 10 cents or a dollar or 10 dollars they would still pay for it so if the price of using it is lower that's better because it enables more use cases and people's wealth disparity in the world so what is a geopolitically important transaction for one person is a cup of coffee to somebody else right so in an expensive area of the world so cost is important but you do get the the pressure because the people are using the same network for many uses i mean some people are using it for trading and prices on a rise in the last few days and that when that happens all the traders pile in and they clog the network up and they will pay they don't really pay that much attention to what the fees cost they want to transact they want to be in the next block and so they will overpay by a factor of 10 just to make that the case and not even think about it so the problem with that is it's um, an automated bidding process so they artificially raise up the fees and disrupt people's ability to do other types of transactions and so, you know, so that, that could be another use case if you had to decide which of those, which would you choose? And I would choose the geopolitically interesting one over the kind of, you know, fun amusement use case, right? Where people are using it where they don't have to, you know, where there are perfectly adequate, effectively zero cost alternatives and there's no particular censorship problem for the user. So I'd say that's, you know. But again, fortunately, it looks like there are enough technology options that we can do both, you know, things like Lightning and other layer two technologies. And the exchange use case is also getting specialized into layer two, like Liquid, which uh, the company Blockstream works on, where it provides advantages actually for people who are doing trading. So it kind of entices them to say, well, rather than you guys like racing to clog up the Bitcoin chain, why don't you use this side chain that's connected with Bitcoin, but will satisfy your case, more optimized for your use case, which is, you know, fast inter-exchange transfers and things like that, so that they can make quick movements and move other types of assets too, other than Bitcoin, you know, sort of uh, US dollar coins and things like that. If they want to do ARP trading and trading strategies, proprietary trading strategies, or take positions quickly or move between Exchanges providing option trading and to hedge what they're doing on another exchange. So, obviously, Liquid is making trade offs that make it inferior for the geopolitically censorship resistant use case, and it's also not able to provide a strong censorship resistance or long term storage guarantees. But for 
people who are exchange trading, their alternative is to give sole custody to an exchange. And as we've seen over the last months, that's a quite risky proposition. So most people who have been involved in professionally or as a hobbyist doing trading have you know, made some profits from their trading, but also lost some money through an exchange hack. Um, so it's a kind of cost of business and Liquid provides a way to avoid that because you can keep your coins in your own equipment and deposit it in a couple of minutes trade and then take the results out so you can reduce your exposure that way and also do tonic trades where with an OTC trade the assets don't need to be on the exchange you can the traders can keep them so I think that kind of thing is, a, is another way so you see more specialization and more layer twos right so lightning for retail payments liquid for exchange trading and the main chain becoming more resilient, like with the satellite coverage and the mesh networks and improved privacy and fungibility and better kind of multi-sig storage security, better fungibility guarantees. I think that's the answer that, you know, if you have everything on one chain, it's going to be one size fits all and it's going to be suboptimal for everybody. Where if you have different chains or different layers for different use cases, that's good. There's got to be a chain base layer and if the base layer is a Bitcoin chain, that can specialize for providing extremely strong censorship resistance, decentralization, and uh, finality guarantees. So what do you consider are its fundamental strengths and what makes Bitcoin interesting? You talked a fair bit about uh, some of its properties, and specifically, what makes Bitcoin special and different from other coins? Um, so, I mean, to my point of view, you know, there are people with different views, so I'm not saying it's, it's right, but it's my perspective, which I arrived at, you know, pretty much immediately when I got involved with Bitcoin, which is, you know, I think it's sort of like somebody invented TCP IP and that became the bedrock for internet technology. And at some point it was, it became very clear that TCP IP was the winner. Everything else was providing compatibility layers with that. Now, if you imagine that TCP IP had come with a way for people to make, you know, there were no, nobody got rich by being the inventor of TCP IP, but if there was a way for somebody to copy TCP IP, change the name, change some constants that don't really change its behavior and market it heavily, then there would have been thousands of copies of TCP IP and it would have slowed down internet progress and adoption. So to my point of view, we have, internet money, it's Bitcoin, and the rest is actually a distraction. Some of the activities are over-exuberant, even verging on fraud or so on, and so it's likely to attract regulators to calm down the worst excesses which could have side effects for the main project of having unsensible internet money. And coincidentally, I mean, you know, it may be an obvious side effect that the huge amount of money that's gone into that, much of it I mean, there hasn't been that much applied research or useful productivity that's come out of it. So while well, probably something like 90% of the money that was, air quotes, invested in blockchain development went into various altcoins and ICOs and things, most of the value has been developed by the 10% that went in, typically through conventional financing, unfortunately, but also some you know, Bitcoiners invested in companies as well. Um, they actually did all the heavy lifting and all the innovation. So I wouldn't say all, because there are people that are promoting altcoins who also have actual features or actual applied research. Often they are reusing technology that some that came out of the Bitcoin sector, but there there is some actual you know, experimentation that is interesting and useful that's tied. But I would say it's a tiny minority, unfortunately. So. That makes me somebody that is thinking that there's a, a winner takes all. And I, sometimes the people that are promoting these coins will, will try to say that's anti-competitive or it's mean, you know, like they should have a chance to or something. But I, I think it's just a question of personal ethics. I think that when I joined the Bitcoin Talk Forum, some people who had created some altcoins before like jumped, you know, like pounced me, um, tried to get me to join that altcoin. And, I thought about it for like literally under a minute before I realized like, okay, why do they want me to join their coin? They just want the brand name of somebody's name. So firstly, this is going to tarnish my reputation. So secondly, if I was going to do this, I would collect the money myself rather than have them profiteer from my reputation. And thirdly, it's all in the space of a minute. That's, that's horrible, right? That's like vandalism. You've got something that is 
extremely interesting societally and you are reducing its chances of success by you know, playing around and profiteering and fooling naive investors to buy something which probably has no long-term future, or if it has a short-term future, it's like very speculative, penny stock, you know. So I wanted no part of it. So that, that was my short exploration <laughs> mental exercise of would I do this? And so yeah, absolutely not. So yeah, but that's not to say there aren't interesting things that people do with investments and blockchains. I think blockchains have a lot of potential interest for uh, investment use cases in terms of tracking share ownership or investment rights and on a profit share basis or other things like that or other assets like gold repositories, fiat coins. So obviously almost none of those things have as much trustlessness as Bitcoin itself because there is you know, somebody with a gold repository, somebody with some US dollars in a bank account or somebody actively managing a company. And there may be regulations that apply to some of those things. And because they are operated and managed by identified people typically, it's it's not going to be a, a kind of sensor-resistant, anonymous kind of activity typically, right? But nevertheless, it's, it's interesting and useful because the technology used in financial markets is much older and messier than people think it is. And there are failures to settle which are technological and then they have to resolve them with you know, a review board once every day or something like that. And people have to provide insurance and there's a whole flow pattern of who has to insure what to, to make it all work and lots of uh, risk scoring and analysis to work out if they can allow somebody to do something so that they could cover the loss. And they'll try and balance, you know, one person speculating one way against somebody else speculating another way. So there is there is a chance for the whole thing to blow up because it's a sort of network of balanced risks that people are taking if some black swan event happens. So, and occasionally it happens, you know, there will be some financial event and a hedge fund will have to close the doors tomorrow morning kind of thing, they took the wrong position. Um, so with the with blockchain tech for those kind of assets, it, it's interesting because it provides one main aspect to, that you get from Bitcoin related tech, which is you don't need a middleman to do a transaction. And the transaction is fairly immediate and final and it's tracked. So there can't exist two of the asset by accident. And actually that two of the asset by accident actually happens in the financial networks. And that's why they have to have these review boards to fix the mistakes every day. And that's basically because people are allowed to, they're authorized to make it sell. So they can say, well, I'm selling this and I have it. And that's just a claim. And if they made a mistake and they don't have it, or they lent it to somebody else, or they were intending to buy it, but they forgot, or they didn't do it in time. And then either they'll make it good or they'll pay the cash equivalent. And occasionally that can get out of hand if there are you know, more sales than shares in the company that they're selling. Uh, so you, you couldn't buy it if you wanted to, kind of thing. Fair enough. Um, so I wanted to ask, what areas of research are you most excited about? Uh, so personally, when I got involved with Bitcoin, um, I previously worked on electronic cash systems that predate Bitcoin, so Hashcash itself and Digicash and a protocol by Chorn, and there was another protocol by Stefan Brands, which is a more modern flexible and efficient protocol than Chorms. And I'd implemented that in a library. And so because of the interest in privacy technology, one of the key missing things to make that work in a good way is to have a way to pay for things, uh, to pay for a privacy network service to make it scale. Or if you're private on the internet and you buy something, and the only way to buy is with a credit card, then you don't have privacy in practice. So electronic cash was always the kind of holy grail application that cypherpunks were interested in so for me this was you know, it was a period that felt like somewhat bitcoin like in the 90s where people were pretty excited there was a lot of a lot of uh, financial world excitement and a couple startups doing things which were in the news a lot and a lot of kind of internet user interest and it ran into a problem which is it was very centralized there's a single central database in the charm server model and then went bankrupt, and that was the end of it. So I had some of those coins, and you know, you don't know if the coins are valid because the only thing that proves whether they're valid or not is a central database that you know 
for like a salt and scrap or something. Mm -hmm. um, so when when Bitcoin came out, what I thought was okay, that's that's great. It's you know finally getting back on track, and somebody's found a way to make it work because people, including myself and a few other people, tried over you know many years post Digicash to find a way to overcome the centralization problem, how to make a more decentralized version of that, and mining with Hashcash became a central part of that once Hashcash were released it, it sparked people's imagination to you know, solve one of the problems which is Digicash tried to partner with banks and that was another problem. So with mining it became clear that you could bypass the need for a direct interface. You could just mine coins into existence and then you could have a market where people would buy and sell them. So that would solve the kind of on-ramp and off-ramp uh, dependency. But Bitcoin achieved its, you know, it achieved the decentralization and solved. I think one of the main problems that people saw at the time was uh, a difficulty in controlling inflation in this environment because we were thinking, okay, let's say you can mine coins and computers get faster all the time and there's a financial incentive to mine as many as you can and then it will create hyperinflation and the value will fall to zero and that will be bad or you'll have hyperinflation. So mm -hmm. people were trying to figure out ways to achieve a more stable value with it and uh, nobody really found a very decentralized solution. There were some kind of federated solutions or market solutions that uh, Nick Sarbweb proposed one and Wade Dye proposed another called um, BitGold in Nick Sarbweb's case and B-Money in Wade Dye's case. But they were not as decentralized as Bitcoin's solution to that problem. Uh, Bitcoin's solution is, in hindsight, surprisingly simple, which is you don't try, you just fix the rate of supply and you let the market figure the rest out. But Bitcoin was able to do that in a clever way that doesn't rely on any external human inputs. It's purely uh, satisfiable by the peer-to-peer -peer network in a kind of incentive compatible and independently verifiable way. So that's kind of, I, to my mind, the main technical innovation of Bitcoin. Like all of the other parts of it were actually being discussed actively in the late, late 90s, uh, like 97, 98 onwards, mm -hmm. uh, including like the mining using Hashcash, Byzantine General's problem, kind of uh, solutions, broadcasting the transactions, having distributed double spend database. So a lot of that sounds familiar and it was there. So the like design outline, but not like a specification, so it wasn't implemented. So coming back to your question, I think the the thing that occurred to me is like, well, that's that's great. You solve the problem that, you know, myself and others are trying to solve in terms of finding the missing solutions to make it viable and it's decentralized which is what we were trying to achieve but it really has pretty bad privacy and fungibility so the digicash and chorman brands protocols that i'd implement in the library have extremely strong privacy so you get cryptographic fungibility meaning that if somebody gives you a coin and somebody else says oh, that that coin was used on the silk road i don't want that to be respent right? which i disagree with but you know people I want to try with the cryptographic fungibility you get with Chorman brands there's nothing you can do about it because nobody on the network other than the sender alone not even the recipient can tell can distinguish two coins so the reason you can't weaken fungibility is you have no mechanism to distinguish coins and so Bitcoin lacks that and so I spent a lot of time researching and implementing things in that space so I thought oh, well let's um Let's see if we can improve that, like re-edit, because you've got a working system and if you can re-add that to it, then you get closer to the idealized virtual cash system. So that's where the things like confidential transactions came from. It's a way to encrypt parts of the transactions and encrypt the values in the transaction using homomorphic encryption. Very cool. So Peter Willow has recently put out a draft Bitcoin improvement proposal on Schnorr signatures and Taproot. Could you describe what Schnorr signatures are and how they would be implemented in Bitcoin? Uh, yeah, so actually I was constantly one of the early people enthusiastic about Schnorr signatures and trying to point people at the, you know, the protocol and the advantages of it as a signature protocol compared to DSA. So 
I mean, the advantages particularly are that they are more mathematically clean. And with DSA, the Schnorr signature historically came first, but Professor Krauss Schnorr patented it, and nobody in the internet protocol world will use a patented algorithm. So nothing happened with it until it expired. But in the meantime, the NSA employed somebody to clone it and change it a little bit and pretend or claim that that doesn't infringe on the patent to get around the patent. They refused to pay it. And so that's DSA, and that became like uh, this standard. And the process by which they kind of obfuscated or changed it made it more inelegant, less mathematically composable. And so it gave it a number of disadvantages and actually reduced the security guarantees, even like the provable security guarantees. So that's expired uh, just before Bitcoin uh, was released, actually. And so the people that were aware of that and knew the advantages of Schnorr, it's like, okay, Bitcoin should have used Schnorr, really. And like, maybe it should migrate to it as soon as people get interested to add an additional signature up with an option. And so I discussed on Bitcoin Wizards with a number of people who were experts in applied cryptography, what this could do. So you know, it's aggregatable, so you can add together multiple signatures into a single signature so you have you know like a three of three signature will be a third smaller than it would be otherwise and uh, it's easier to make a blind signature with it so it has that advantage too and it has a better mathematical proof and it has also support for blinding and so the idea that you can make a blind signature more easily with it and these will come because it's a cleaner mathematical construct so that's great and what Peter released and there were other people working on that, Greg Maxwell, Johnson Lau, and probably other people, I haven't been actively involved in it. Actually this is the second, there was a, earlier some months ago a bit with the format for the cryptography and they also did a lot of work, so some, some of the guys at Blockstream and some of the other open source contributors on the specific mechanics of how to do these multiple signatures, uh, particularly using deterministic signing so it, it turned out to be harder to do multiply deterministic signing than it is to do single signature deterministic signing and the determinism is quite useful as a sort of security property so the later bits that peter is and others have published are to do with how to integrate it into bitcoin so the formats and the opcodes and how they work and interact with other things and then it also combine it with taproot which is another feature cool so earlier this weekend you wanted to switch the topic of your talk to focus on the recent binance hack and the talk of a reorg to recover the funds why are bitcoin reorgs a bad idea so i think there are a number of technical reasons and a number of economic game theory reasons and also some geopolitical reasons so it's just a full spectrum bad idea in every conceivable way. And I think the problem is that a lot of those things are not obvious if they're not things you've thought about before, or if you look at it in the narrow scope. You know, if, if you look at something that's unfortunate, people are nice and they want to help fix the problem. But the problem is the side effects from trying to fix the problem are far worse than the, you know, than the positive effect of fixing the problem. Right? It would actually be cheaper for people to have a whip around and like pay them back than the immense negative side effects of damaging Bitcoin's finality. So, um, I mean, to give some examples, let's see where to start. On the on a technical side, so Peter has written something, and I saw, I saw Greg Maxwell also commented on the game theory. So one way that people propose that something could be undone is to take the money that was stolen and spend it again and give it to miners generally as a group. And then that would incentivize miners to rewrite history and claim the money. But that, you know, it, it's kind of like a chess game, right? If you, if you don't look ahead and you make a move, then you'll be surprised when you lose and you get in a checkmate situation. So. You know, that, that sounds okay on the face of it, but like, okay, the next move, you've got to think, got to change perspective and think about what somebody who is antagonistic to your desired outcome would maximally maliciously do to counter you. And that's hard to do for humans generally. So some people are wired that way or, you know, build up an ability to think in that way. But 
some people are just gifted at that kind of thing. And so what they're saying is that, okay, so what is, what is somebody going to do to counter that? Well, the person who stole the coins, he can counter you. He has free money and he can bribe the miners more. And so that's, that's where you get into the so-called scorched earth, which is there's a bidding war to zero where the person who had the money stolen and the person who stole it promised to pay the miners ultimately all of the money. So some people might argue, well, maybe that's better than doing nothing because even though the person who had the money stolen doesn't get it back, the person who stole it doesn't benefit from it. So, well, you know, maybe that would disincentivize future thefts. Maybe. That's like... The first chess move, the next chess move is, okay, let's say hypothetically, I really don't think this is even plausible that it would happen in the Bitcoin space. But let's say hypothetically people lost their minds and decided to really try to undo it. So as Peter and Greg observe in their online uh, write-up on Stack Exchange, what would happen is it would be slow because there's a coordination problem. You have to reach miners and many pieces of mining equipment and pools are unattended in different time zones. And you know, in previous emergencies, you've seen like somebody about to catch a plane and if they hadn't caught them, they would have been offline. They wouldn't be unreachable for like hours and stuff like that. And so your coordination problem. So let's say you managed to reach two thirds of the network. Now a third of it is fighting against you. So you're gonna be operating at half speed, definitionally, right? And you have to rewrite history. So presumably six hours have passed or, or more, like 12 hours have passed, let's say. Mm -hmm. And so to undo this is going to operate at half speed and it's going to undo 12 hours of work. So it's going to take 24 hours. And now what's going to happen? Well, the attacker, obviously, I mean, I don't know why people don't think about this, but what's the attacker going to do? He's going to say, oh, I'm going to lose all the funds. Therefore, I'm going to swap the funds. For other funds. I'm going to swap them for old coins, I'm going to swap them for electronic goods or any, anything tradable, mm -hmm. right? And so now the people that would argue you know, switch back to the other hat, which is, well, but we want to get the funds back. They say, well, we told everybody that these are the uh, addresses that were stolen, so they won't accept the stolen funds. But they're not thinking about the fact that most of the community doesn't want to introduce undoes. So they will pretend they will either refuse to do the blacklist or they pretend to do the blacklist but have a air quotes accident and accept them anyway. And then what's going to happen is lots and lots of innocent bystanders or pretend innocent bystanders are going to be holding the stolen coins and they're going to complain and say, don't reorganize my money. It's me you're stealing off and I'm an innocent bystander that, you know, accidentally swapped these coins for something, right? Mm -hmm. And then you have a mess. Like, it's uh, not going to be possible to determine who's lying, who's pretending, who's sincere, and who should accept the loss. So it doesn't work. And that, that's just on a technical, like, straightforward, like, two steps, like, game tree of, like, chess game or something, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's the kind of geopolitical damage. So uh, I saw that one political commentator is more establishment, which is Angela Walsh. Uh, she presents at some conferences and she seems very pro-establishment so you know when she sees potential legal problems for bitcoin she's open source about it and she says why that's a good thing for the establishment so you watch what she's saying as as the opposite chess player right mm -hmm. so and she sees it like it seems like some of the people proposing the fork some of who are technical and some not are not seeing it but angela sees it and i see it and all of the bitcoin developers that have been around for a while see it which is you know Okay, so you have an undo. Now, this is a slippery slope argument, right? So if you undo a transaction, that shows an ability to achieve a policy outcome, right? And again, the chess move scenario, do people proposing it think this will be the one and only ever undo and that all undos will be equally palatable to people undoing them, right? So you say, well, it's a straight theft. I say, well, okay, already there's a question as well. How do we really know that Binance actually lost the money versus the air quotes stole it and it's themselves? So, okay, we trust them probably. They probably didn't do that. But you don't know. The next one could be an accidental hack. And there have definitely been suspicious events where some exchanges have been air quotes hacked and people are pretty sure that they actually stole it themselves, but they can't prove it. So in that case, you could, you know, let an exchange 
or other business pretend to steal money and get repaid. But you know, the worst scenario is that now it becomes a court places an order. Like there's a silk road, money starts moving, and the US government wants to stop it moving, or something else happens. Use imagination, right? Uh, something unpopular for the community, but they've shown it's possible with policy to do this coordination, or even worse, they try to build tools to do it. Now, Bitcoin isn't final. It's not censorship resistant money, and you know it loses one of its main reasons for existence. So I think that's you know from a geopolitical perspective a horrendous idea. So there are you know more game tree outcomes like that, but it's uh, just generally a bad idea. <laughs> Well, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, it sounds like uh, a reorg would fundamentally compromise some of the core features and protocols within Bitcoin. Right. I mean, I think some people get a bit hung up on what is the specifics of the technology implementation as it is today, and would say, well, the technology makes it possible, therefore, that's the way it works. Like, it's a smart contract, and it must execute as a smart contract. But you know, the protocols improve over time and the way they get improved is people observe weaknesses and then they work to improve them. And not everything is technically possible, you know, like it's not technically possible to stop people from stealing private keys. That doesn't mean we go out and steal private keys, right? So the boundaries of what's technically possible are not perfectly aligned with what is ethically right or sensible to do. And so when people say that, oh, you know, there are reorgs, small reorgs happening at random, and therefore it's okay to do this, <laughs> that doesn't make any sense at all, right? That's, that's just an observation. You know, that's not a policy decision. That's an automated, unwanted and unattended technology limitation. And there are things we can do to reduce the limitations. So Luke Dasher has um, a mining pool protocol that switches pools automatically if it sees uh, a single pool starting to remine a lower block hash that indicates the reorg. So apparently for some years, for different reasons, but it has this side effect, would switch pool in that event. I mean, there are other things you could do. I mean, another type of thing you could do is to uh, make mining equipment which refuses to mine backwards, put that logic into miners at different depths of the equipment. And I think that would be a useful thing to do. I mean, if you consider today, there is a strong economic incentive because of the mining reward. And historically, Bitcoin price has more than doubled every four years. So the halving hasn't reduced that. However, the, the value being transacted has increased. So the security incentive is securing more value. And so that you know there are sort of at times more economic incentive to reorganize to steal money, like to double spend money forcibly and things like that. So in the longer term, presumably eventually Bitcoin reaches saturation and everybody that wants and sees the future benefit of sense resistant internet money has invested in that the steady state get stable value and some more halvings in some decades time and the subsidy payment will reduce and you know fees may be enough to keep it secure but not as much and so you know then this line of thinking about oh like the protocol says you can reorg would uh, basically break bitcoin at that point so that's partly why people are somewhat concerned to see a functioning fee market so that there's plausible security that can be had but other things you can do, right? so you can build protocols that agree on finality in other ways. So one way to do that is you just make lots of equipment that's increasingly tamper resistant and baked into the ASIC even. Uh, it just doesn't go backwards, it's like a little mini ASIC that's got a ratchet in it. And now, you know, people suddenly wanted to have an emergency, well like, what are you going to do? You know, go remanufacture billions of dollars of equipment, it's not going to happen, right? So it will be another break on... Uh, undoes, which I think would be a good thing. So there are no doubt other things you can do, and in my viewpoint, should do to uh, improve Bitcoin's finality. And I think um, you know, there's another branch of the game tree there, which is while this slow undo is happening, that there are other people who are kind of opportunistic and can see that with some plausibility, they can deposit coins on exchange, swap them for. Uh, something else, then it will get undone. Even you know, everything will get undone, right? Mm -hmm. And then they can, you know, wait until they got their other coins on another network, 
and then they can do a big RBF transaction so that the next time the transaction is processed, they'll get their money back, right? So I think that means even more coordination needed, either a more sophisticated protocol needed for an undo, which is implausible to develop and test in hours, right? That's the kind of thing that would take six months or something mm -hmm. in normal course. And um, a massive disruption. I think the entire Bitcoin ecosystem will basically be off for days because nobody would dare accept transactions that could be almost certainly double spent. So I think, again, the people proposing this hadn't thought of that simple outcome that would happen. Um, there are reasons that exchanges want to wait for like three or six confirmations because they don't want that double spending. People are systematically creating accounts on exchanges and trying to abuse their security policies, account recovery policies, double spend policies. You know, when you have final uncensorable internet money, people will systematically game it. And so you have security is the weak point. So just drastically rewriting the security process without thinking about it will have all kinds of unintended side effects. And you know, the loss of a day's trading revenue for the entire ecosystem is hundreds of times more than the loss, right? If you went to all the exchanges and said, how much would you be willing to pay to avoid a 24 hour outage? That would times over would pay the, the loss. So it doesn't make economic sense to do it. Fair enough. So let's rewind a little bit back to Schnorr signatures and talk about the differences between Taproot and Graftroot. Uh, yes, yeah, so Taproot is the one that's closer, so that's part of the draft specification that has been put for community review. And what that does is a clever trick using a pay-to-contract-like mechanism so that you can... I mean, many Bitcoin smart contracts or scripts are four branches, A or B, and the A part of it is typically you sign with a public key and that's it. And the B part of it is something more complicated, like, okay, after this amount of time, then using this hash pre-image or this multi-signature, then you can spend the money in a different way. And so that, that tends to enable people to fingerprint wallets. So Blockstream has a wallet called Green, formerly called Green Address, and it has one of these kind of contracts in it. It has a two of two signature, or a time block and a single signature, and you can see that on the chain, right? Every time those are spent, you can see. And so that means people can look on the chain and say, well, all of these transactions, they probably came from green wallet users. We don't know which ones are which, we don't know which belong to the same wallet generally, but we know we've got fingerprinting. And yet the the escape clause, the other part of the branch, only gets used like, you know, once, once in a blue moon, like 99.9% .9 of the time never gets used, so it's a kind of recovery situation. And many of them are like that, you know, Lightning has something like that. So uh, what Taproot is able to do with a clever crypto trick is to put the all branch to hide it. And so you just sign with a single signature and they will look the same. So you could be a green wallet or a Lightning channel open or a single signature, and you can't distinguish those things. And then if you need to take the other branch, then you reveal it. And it kind of proves that, oh, you did choose that contract before making a signature and so it's okay for you to sign with this other modified key and satisfy this additional contract as, a, as another way to do it. And so that's Taproot and Graftroot is more of a delegation so it's a way to sort of sign so that you can introduce a new script dynamically. So Taproot is restricted to one script so you have to pre-decide, okay, this is a script. Whereas Graftroot is saying you can introduce alternate spending mechanisms if you can sign with this uh, Graftroot. So it has that kind of delegation flexibility, which Taproot doesn't. But then within Taproot, there's also MOST, which is um, to have more if branches under the first if branch, basically. And those would be a little bit less hidden to the top level, but they're also rarer, right? They're branches within branches. So I wanted to close on a couple of things. Being that cypherpunk is the first thing on your Twitter profile, what are the core tenets of being a cypherpunk and what wisdom would you like to impart? So I think Bitcoin has kind of created a, a bunch of new cypherpunks. So I think technology isn't neutral and the idea that we can introduce, and use and adopt and develop and improve like applications and the core tech for 
infrastructure which tips balance of power towards the individual empowerment is very interesting and positive for society and um, something that grabs people is interesting you know the fact that you can you know, get a smartphone app and receive money and it's uncensorable and you don't need permission you just install the app and off you go and it works globally is super interesting and you know access to the technology and playing with it sparks people's imagination about wow I'm, I'm my own bank you know, look what I can do and look how painful that used to be and now I can just do it and you know the pending transaction is visible to the recipient in a couple of seconds internationally that's amazing and it also you know redefines the landscape over the longer term so I think it's a very, very interesting experiment to see what will happen on a macro scale because, you know, from being around in the 90s and looking at early internet adoption, it took the establishment some time to, you know, big companies and governments and policymakers to get to grips with and accept that the internet's here to stay, that their powers were permanently eroded and that there was nothing they could do about it. You know, sort of their ability to influence the press, the ability for people to communicate privately at a distance and... You know, you can also view this as a legal right as well, in the sense that typically in the internet realm, you tend to lose rights without intending to, because pre-internet, people would have private conversations with physical presence, or even telephone conversations, because there was not the automation to like transcribe and automatically monitor and search them. But all of this tech has been systematically and heavily abused even illegally according to the current you know establishment with Snowden's revelations so there's you know hundreds and hundreds of millions probably billions being spent annually by the establishment to encroach on civil rights and your legal rights and so my view is you should be you should feel fully enabled and within your rights to maximally act as a counterbalance and deploy technology that empowers individuals so yeah, I think the, the cypherpunk's viewpoint was in this space, which is, firstly, that's extremely cool, and they really like the technology implications, and I mean, there's some kind of grey undertone as well, like grey markets are considered to be positive, like, and obviously some grey markets are things that certain individuals like. It doesn't mean that you have to approve of what people are doing on a grey market, but grey markets exist and are a function of a functioning market, and... It basically, society needs an outlet because what is legal at any given time is not typically sensible. So you can't really, society can't function if it has to 100% abide within the restrictions. And some of the policy things you see in some big Asian countries are pretty negative, you know, global surveillance and uh, social profiling and sort of preemptive punishment, lack of ability to travel, things like that. So you can see the dark future and this kind of technology pulls the world back from that dark future. And that dark future is looming for, you know, for America and Europe and everywhere, right? It's, you know, you're seeing the dark future tech getting exported from countries with questionable human rights records to countries that nominally pay lip service to respecting human rights, but, you know, have defense and military industrial complexes that clearly don't from the evidence of Snowden's revelation. So, yeah, we have to act and uh, deploy the technology widely and, you know, explain to people why this is interesting. So it's, it's also interesting that people get involved in Bitcoin for all kinds of different reasons. And the idea and the concepts grow on them as they think about what they can do and find use cases for themselves and their friends and tell others about it. One of the things that we always like to close the show with is, do you have any questions for our listeners or final comments? And how can people find and follow you? So people can find me on Twitter at Adam3US and Blockstream is at Blockstream. And in terms of questions for listeners, I think it's interesting to know about uh, what problems people have with technology. So... You know, if there are use cases you're trying to use or limitations in in a protocol, and personally, I'm interested in applied crypto questions. So, is something possible? It's like in my experience, typically, what leads to new discoveries is a super interesting question that's new. And sometimes I'll be able to find a solution that perhaps somebody who doesn't play with cryptography would not be aware that it's possible. Or 
that could be constructed. So those kind of questions and user questions about you know use cases. I think sometimes people who are you know computer science people or spent their career programming or doing pipe cryptography are like back end server implementers or even application implementers lose track of what's easy and intuitive, right? And as Bitcoin gets more mass market, we need simpler ways to use things. So if people have ideas about you know, why don't you do this? Like, why don't you simplify it? Because people get hung up on the way things work technically and that becomes baked into their assumptions. And we need to get to new simpler assumptions to help the mass market. And even even intuitions are missing for a new user. You know, like what's, what is public key cryptography? That's, that's a very obscure thing on the scale of things. And, you know, people talk about private keys or mnemonics or a string of numbers and letters and you're supposed to write it down and so IT security about where to write it down. Like, do you take a photo of it with your smartphone? Probably not, because it'll get backed up to the cloud and it's the same device. And even the intuition that this is a private number and that I have to do a backup or I can lose it, because their intuition comes from maybe paper cash or having a bank account, losing a pen and being able to get a new one, and that doesn't work here. So that's, that's not obvious to people who are not technology enthusiasts. And so we've got to think out of the box and uh, find ways to make that easier. Obviously people learn and adapt to technology as well. And so sometimes people's adaptability is faster to act than technology uh, usability improvement as well. So people are very adaptable. I mean, cell phones are complicated things that people do fine too. Very cool. Awesome. Well, thank you, Adam, so much for joining me today. It's been a pleasure interviewing you, and I'm excited to produce this episode. I wish you the best of the conference. I hope you enjoy the rest of your time here. Yeah, thanks. It was a fun discussion. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. All right.